more love, more joy, everything. It's inspired young people. Inspiration comes from within you. When you clear out the garbage that's in your mind, you then create space for something better, more beautiful to come in. Let's have life and have it more abundantly. I say yes. It's like taking a workshop. I get to be in my pajamas. We have a very active imagination, which is why it's important to learn how to harness it and then point it in the direction you want to go. I listen to your show every day. It's time now for Living Your Inspired Life with Susan Burrell. Susan is no-nonsense, inspirational, motivational, and fun. This is positive talk radio. Practical wisdom for everyday life. It's a gift you give yourself. Now, here's Susan. Welcome to Living Your Inspired Life. This is Susan Burrell, and you're listening to News Talk 1590 KVTA. And I just want to tell everybody what uh, at the get-go, when we air any show, it's worth repeating. So we archive everything on our website, livingyourinspiredlife.org. And I invite you to go to the website and check out all the good work we've been doing over the last several years. And you might find something that just inspires you. And you can repeat it by going back and back to the website. So it's livingyourinspiredlife.org. So with that said and done, business out of the way, um, I am uh, deeply grateful to have uh, this guest uh, join me today because uh, this is a man that I've been uh, working with for the last year and a half, and I really believe in his work. So I want to welcome Dr. Alan Chang. Thank you so much, Susan. I'm really happy to be here with you today. Uh, I am too. (laughs) So um, Alan Chang has two clinics, the Chang Holistic clinic in Oxnard, and then there is a new clinic in Ojai called the Amara Center. And and Dr. Chang is an acupuncturist. He's one of the best acupuncturists I've ever been. Is that a isisticist? Oh, well, thank you very much. I appreciate that. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, In my experience, so uh, just so the listeners know, I am uh, an advocate of acupuncture. I stumbled on it. Um, right after I had my son and I was in a postpartum depression and I started seeing uh, a Chinese trained acupuncturist who I, I say literally saved my life because the acupuncture and everything else that she did for me gave me my health back and my mental wellness so that I could become a really awesome mom. And So, Alan, I want you to share with everybody, because I know there's a lot of people that don't know about acupuncture or they think it's just to fix a, you know, an achy back or a migraine. Can you just tell everybody about the history of acupuncture? Sure. Acupuncture really has been in existence for about 5,000 years. Wow, 5,000. Yes, that's where we have the first written records for acupuncture, and Really, the the written records are from um, Chinese, either bamboo slats, is where they actually would, would etch the all of the all of the information onto bamboo slats, or also on rock. Oh my goodness! So, so they would actually put on rocks to keep it for posterity. So we really do have these artifacts that are quite old, and some of the and this is acupuncture as well as the philosophy of Chinese medicine, and also with the herbal medicine that's really inherent in Chinese medicine. But what we also find, too, is that we found some some of the oldest uh, kind of preserved um, humans that were in kind of a very dry, cold place in caves, and they actually had tattoos on the back that were in correlation with acupuncture points that were dated, uh, I believe, like five or 6,000 years ago. Wow. And so that, that's where we really saw that there was evidence of acupuncture being in use quite a long time ago and really has been in continuous use all the way up to this day and age. In China now, all the hospitals actually have two wings. There's a distinct wing of Chinese medicine where they will uh, have all the herbal pharmacies where they'll be boiling the herbs for inpatients, like after surgery, and they'll also have the full Western, what we understand as Western medicine, the full surgical centers and oncology centers, and they'll really mix Chinese medicine along with what we know as the kind of the modern pharmaceutical medicine 
and have really found a lot of success. So that's happening right up to this present day and age. Well, it's interesting to me, you know, being in the Western culture, um, I had not even heard about acupuncture until I was suffering so, and I was willing to try anything. And a lot of people say, oh, I don't want to do acupuncture because there's, it involves needles, uh, you know, at, at these particular points. Sure. But sure. To me, in my personal experience, it's it would be awesome if we in America could begin to do what you just described they're doing in China, of having both sides meet at the same place. Well, it's very interesting because that actually is happening. But the way that it's happening is that people actually are coming forward themselves and asking for a different type of medicine. I, I see patients every day that are coming in on their own volition, being self-directed, but also from referrals from MDs all over Ventura County. My father was an acupuncturist and a chiropractor. Uh, he actually was one of the first to, to hold a dual degree in Ventura County, uh, and probably in California, actually. Um, he actually uh, had his, his uh, chiropractic license since uh, 19... 77, mm-hmm. and then 10 years later, in 1987, had his acupuncture license. So he's belonged to a medical group in Ventura County, and so after he's passed away, and this is his 14th year since his passing, when he passed in 2002, we still have uh, constant referrals from MDs in the area, and they, that the referrals come every week. Wow. And so at this point... Uh, medical doctors, as well as patients, understand that there are, as there are limitations to all types of medicines and modalities, that there is a lot of what that can be done with acupuncture, and there's a lot that can be done if we need to do surgery, a lot that can be done with herbal medicine uh, for chronic diseases, and some for really for acute cases, but also pharmaceutical medicine for acute cases. So there's an understanding that the blending is important. But what we're lacking, as opposed to what's happening in China, is actually a, a deeper training in both, an understanding of both, and really a strong communication between the two different sides of, of these very powerful modalities of Eastern medicine, we can call it, or and also Western medicine. So it's happening, but it's happening uh, in a way that is still not quite as uh, not quite as a, a flow as it is in China, but it definitely is happening. Patients themselves are coming in when they see that, well, you know, we're, we've tried one direction for a period of time, and it's not quite bringing me to where I need to, mm-hmm. and so they, they switch, mm-hmm. and they come in, and they kind of go back and forth. So I see many patients for acupuncture, you know, whether it's really for you know, really classic, like lower back, muscle tension, shoulder tension, rotator cuff. I also see a lot of patients for infertility, migraine headaches, for women's health issues, um, for men health issues. So there really is quite a, a wide spectrum of what we, can, what we can actually treat with Chinese medicine and acupuncture. So it's really we're coming to a place in our our time that everyone is coming to a strong understanding that we do need to take responsibility of our own health. And to do so, it involves also dietary therapy as well as um, herbal supplementation and also lifestyle and exercise. So with all of these blended together, we can actually keep ourselves much healthier than if we uh, don't do that. I'm really glad that uh, you're pointing up that it's beginning to come together here in America because 20 years ago when I started acupuncture, I remember going to my oncologist because I'm type 1 diabetic. I think everybody knows that who listens to the show. And I was extolling acupuncture. I was like, man, this is better than, you know, anything I've ever tried. And he, uh, a very educated doctor, I really respected him. That's why he was my doctor. And he basically said, well, you know, really, acupuncture is really more like hypnotherapy. It doesn't, you know, it's just a placebo. And I thought I was floored. I said, how can you say that about something that's been around 
3,000, 5,000 years? And he said, no, that's, that's the research. I was like, oh, boy, I don't know where you're getting your research, buddy. <laughs> well, you know, at that time, especially about 20, 25 years ago, there really was no English language research. Mm. And so that's really, and you know, to, you know, myself holding a very high regard to the entire medical community, that was the best information that they had. They had no English language research to really draw from to know that this was really working or not. Um, you know, of course, there's been Chinese uh, research that's obviously going back thousands of years, but if you have no translations of that, mm-hmm. and you have no knowledge of that, then you know the best care that you could give to your patient is what you know. And so, you know, that's really the the whole culture that my father came into as he began his practice of both chiropractic as well as acupuncture. And, you know, I really see that he really paved the way for this journey for myself to be able to come into this practice and and be able to not only educate his patients, but also to educate his peers in the medical community. And now at this point, I mean, I actually am seeing medical doctors come in to see me for acupuncture. Wow. Uh, yeah, and because, you know, they they know themselves. You know, if the for example, if if there's a rotator cuff injury and they know from an MRI that there is some tear but it's not enough to really warrant a surgery, well what else do you do? You could do physical therapy and that's also helpful. But really acupuncture is very, very successful in working with soft tissue damage and tear because what it really does is to bring more blood flow to the particular area. And as it does that, it allows our body's innate healing ability to actually accelerate. So really when we're talking about how to heal our bodies and also really moving into the whole idea of anti-aging, we're really talking about how do we allow our body to heal itself faster as it is naturally designed to do. And that really is the, the foundational philosophy of Chinese medicine. The idea of Chinese medicine is not that, you know, you have to do something else to your body in order for you to gain a particular outcome. It is that if you're actually becoming ill or if there is something, you know, something that's happening outside of an acute trauma like an accident or something, then you're, you had lacked your own responsibility in taking care of yourself. It's really interesting, uh, as we talk about the whole kind of medical models of of Chinese medicine and Western medicine, in the old days of when the Chinese doctors would really be going from each village and taking care of specific families that they were uh, really uh, close to, the way of payment was that each family in a village would give a monthly payment to the doctor. And they keep the doctor the, the monthly payment to keep them well. Mm. So if, if any one of the family members actually got sick, then the doctor would not get paid. <laughs> oh, that's interesting. That's like the reverse. It is exactly the reverse. Talk about which, paying it forward. Exactly. And so that payment forward really also, also really lends to the idea and the philosophical culture of each individual person taking on the responsibility of knowing how to take care of themselves and listening to how to take care of themselves from the advice given by the Chinese doctor. If they were following the advice and they kept themselves well, then they knew it was good advice and they kept paying the doctor. If they were following the advice and they didn't get well and when they got sick, then they thought, well, this advice is not quite right. You better come up with a better idea. Uh-huh. And then, then we're really working in a very good collaboration between how each individual and how the doctor can keep the society and community well and healthy. This is it's a much better model that we can work with rather than when you actually get sick, then you're really trying to look for another way. Right. I, I love that story, Alan, because... 
one of the things we talk about on living your inspired life all the time is about self-responsibility, making making right. uh, that your choices affect your life and becoming consciously awake and aware to how you're choosing to live your life and you can you can live it well or you can live it unhealthily. Right. That's great. Yeah. Uh-huh. And that really is the way that we really should view ourselves as we're really looking at the entire, I would say, kind of spiritual, philosophical spectrum of Chinese medicine. When I say this, it really means when we're looking at Chinese medicine, we're looking at not only how the physical body is actually attuning itself to the highest degree of health, but also how our mental or emotional mindset is being held in the environment of whether we're under stress, you know, whether we feel like we're not doing what we are ultimately passionate about. And, you know, that's where we, we get some emotional and mental stress. But also on the third level is also how, how is our spirit? How is our spirit being looked at? Are we looking at what we truly want to do with our lives? Are we really in alignment with what we see is to be our highest, our own highest good, our own individual path? And so in Chinese medicine, we looked very carefully at where, where an individual was at their spirit level, at their mental, emotional level, and how it then ultimately affects our physical level. Okay, so wait, let me just reiterate what you just said. So in Chinese medicine, you're looking, you, you first start with the individual spiritual, uh, I want to say spiritual level, but spiritual awareness, if they're Correct. even awake and aware to a spiritual connection. So you do Correct. it from the top down as opposed to the bottom up. That's how I'm seeing it. Because the physical is like the end result, in my mind, of what we are as spiritual beings. There is a fluid transition that goes both directions Mm -hmm. because we can see also if there is a physical ailment that's happening, that's also a reflection of where our emotional and mental level and ultimately of where our spiritual level is. For example, I'm treating many patients currently now, and we're living in in a time period where there seems to be a lot of stress that's happening in various levels of our lives whether it's at a work level, family level, relationship level. And what we see is that we're also seeing um, quite a lot of people with some compromised immune system, meaning that if you're under constant stress, your immune system is always being activated. And as it's being constantly activated, then it gets you feel a bit run down. Yeah. So, you know, what we're, what we're translating here is that at a mental, emotional level, if we're constantly under stress, we're going to affect how our physical body really can be. But when we look at an even deeper level of that, if we look at how our spirit is being spoken to or how it's being related to, and really the question deeply is, are we aware of our own spirit? Are we aware of the deeper meaning of actually our life meaning of our life path. Are we actually looking at this area? If we're not, then probably all of the life circumstances around us will stress us out. Right. And with that stress, that will probably affect our physical level. So we can look at both ways, going from the physical up to the mental, emotional, up to the spirit level, and also looking at the spirit level how it affects the mental, emotional, and how it affects the physical. So we can look at, we can use kind of insight into each of these levels to kind of see the other. But you know, as we're looking at what we can really look at in a you know, very physical way, we can also look at how our mental construct and our spiritual awareness is also affecting our body. Oh my gosh. So it really, you really are a holistic doctor. That is what the whole journey of really being a human is. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, what I find in my own journey of really growing up in this medicine, I feel so grateful now. Um, but, you know, we're, 
many times not living in a culture that really looks at that. And so where I feel my ability to be able to help to educate and just really bring an awareness to all of us living in this community at this time is, you know, how, how are we relating to ourselves? How are we relating to other people in our community around us? And how are we relating to the deepest meaning of why we are here on Earth? And how we relate to, uh, you know, another source, whether we call it God or we just call it uh, the unified field. You know, how, how are we looking at all these different aspects? And if we, if we can look at these, I feel, I feel we have a much, much better chance of being balanced in our physical reality. So let me ask you this question. Is it challenging for you when you have a patient who comes to you and it's all about their physical body and they haven't even opened up into their spiritual awareness? Well, it's not really difficult for me because we do need to start at whatever level Mm -hmm. that we're, we're coming into. But, you know, there is a part of me that deeply wants to be able to give the gift of learning or the gift of awareness so that everyone can come to a higher or at least a wider awareness of where our physical body really, how it's being affected and how our spiritual awareness can affect our physical body. So, for you know, really, really, what I what I find is is that if we're if we're only looking at the physical body, mm-hmm. and we're you know, unfortunately, you know, we have a lot of uh, we have a, such a huge surges of like uh, plastic surgery or like working out in gyms to kind of sculpt your body or even Botox which is botulism, putting it to our, our own body. You know, these are kind of what I would say is what society is, is really showing as a deeper illness. You know, why do we feel that we need to put ourselves into a situation that may cause ourselves more harm in order to meet a cultural, what we call, quote-unquote, norm? Right. And, you know, to me, that is really shows some indication of where we are as a spiritual being in our, in our cultural um, reality now. But, you know, having said that, unless we really have an ease with our physical body, is there really a way to be able to look deeper into where our mental, emotional stress states are? or even to look at our our deeper spiritual path. You know, I remember my my father would would really talk to me about this. I I would have discussions with him and say, well, you know, we just need to just look deeper and really, you know, everybody already knows how to heal themselves. And he he looked at me, you know, as a bunny acupuncturist just going through my, my master's program, and he said, well... It's true, but if somebody is in so much pain that they can't even think straight, how can they even look at all the different elements around them? You can't have somebody change their diet if they're in extreme pain. It just it doesn't work that way. So in my practice, what I really try to do is to work with each individual person and what they're really bringing and be able to at least alleviate some stress or pain, and then be able to really give a wider perspective of where we can be. And this is really where the opening of the center of Amara in in Ojai, Ojai, yes, and really bring together a group of instructors and practitioners of various healing modalities, and bring together Qigong, and I will be teaching Tai Chi and also doing a somatic body movement, Unlock Your Body with, with physical therapy, as well as doing yoga. All of these aspects help us to 
to be able to have more physical exercises and activities help well round, well round our own uh, brain perception. And so what I mean by this is can we use physical activities to allow the stress of our emotional body, of our mental body, be alleviated? Can we let our stress go by engaging in activities that will be relaxing, that will allow us to really come to terms with how we're under such a, a very aggressive time frame where everyone wants, is just kind of go, 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 and we're kind of rewarded for that. What we see on a physiological level is that when we're always living in a sympathetic, adrenalized state, it really causes a lot of chronic as well as acute problems. So how can we, as a society and as individuals, engage in meaningful activities such as Tai Chi, Qigong, yoga, really getting awareness of our own body pattern to be able to allow a deeper healing to occur, not just in a, in a one-hour session, but throughout the entire day, throughout the entire week, throughout the entire month. Well, and, and these uh, these exercise these modalities of exercise that you're talking about, I, and I'd like you to speak to each one if you would. But these sure. are more of a slow, you know, because a lot of people, I know a lot of people that are high stress, and they're like, you know, I'm just going to run for an hour and a half, or I'm just going to get on my bike and right. climb that mountain. And I'm like, how is that de-stressing you? Except that right. you're physically exhausted, and then, you know. But these modalities of Tai Chi and et cetera, there and yoga, and there, it's a slower movement so that you do get to get in touch with um, who you are and where that's, you're at. That's exactly right. And, you know, I think it's, uh, it, well, I, I would say, for example, yoga now is gaining a lot of popularity and prominence. And then now there's like power yoga where you go in and really get your sweat on and everything. And it's wonderful, it's really great. But what I'm noticing in my practice of acupuncture Chinese medicine and how I'm seeing patients on a daily basis is that many, many people are actually living in a world that they're basically living on semi-exhaustion or mm -hmm. more than that. And the only way to get to let their mind calm down is to exhaust themselves even more. So in the, in the practice of medicine, if we're, if we're only trying to push ourselves and exhaust ourselves, it's kind of like leaving a flashlight on and the battery just going to run down and run down, or like leaving the headlights on your car on like all day and the battery gets, starts to run down. I mean, you can do it for a while, but at a certain point, the battery just is completely drained and is not able to recharge itself, especially a car battery. So the, the way that I've seen, I've seen my patients really be able to regain their health and really to come into uh, a deeper well-being is to engage in activities that will, at the same time, give them physical movement and exercise, but are also movements that allow their deeper energetic to be able to replenish itself. So again, at the beginning of the program, we talked about how working with Chinese medicine as a holistic practice, we're looking at how to allow the innate healing ability of our body to begin to heal the body faster. So working with these exercises, such as Tai Chi, um, the Tai Chi that I'm teaching is actually the Tai Chi uh, Yang style form that my grandfather actually taught me um, first 20 years ago. And so really what we're working with in Tai Chi is to work with slow, subtle movement that actually will activate the deeper muscle layers. And as the deeper muscle layers are being activated in a slow, consistent movement, it actually allows 
the muscles to gently squeeze around the long bones in the body. The long bones being, like, especially the femur in our legs and also the bones in our arms. But by allowing the muscles to gently squeeze around the bone, what it does is activate the body's ability to create new red blood cells in the bone marrow. So by activating new blood cells, that's actually how we can allow our body to heal itself faster. So in all of these movements that are a little bit slower, these movements actually are designed to allow our body to Mm self-heal. We're not trying to exercise to exhaustion or exercise to only gain muscle mass in the very superficial muscles so that we look good, but to really gain a depth of the deeper muscles that will help with the stability and flexibility with our entire body and frame and also to help to increase the bone marrow production of red blood cells, which will help to heal our body. And so this is this is really what the depth of these practices are. And that's also true for yoga as well. It's working different uh, different uh, systems in the body with every pose, and it's it's exactly. not about powering through. So I feel like I had a workout. It's about m- moving through the poses so that the different systems and and organs in our body get replenished. That's exactly right. There are many different postures that have been used, again, for really thousands of years that relate to the meridian systems in acupuncture that will really link up with physical organs. So, for example, in Chinese medicine, there are uh, meridians which are lines of energy or channels of energy that run through the body and directly relate to the specific organs, for example, the liver or the kidneys or the lungs. So there are specific qigong exercises that are done that will really activate and allow the flow of blood and the flow of energy through the meridians or channels that will directly help to invigorate the specific organs like the liver, the lungs, the heart, the kidneys. And the same is true with yoga. As we're moving through these poses, it's really allowing the body to be able to be at ease and being at ease at the same time to strengthen the muscle, to be able to hold poses to allow for the body to heal itself. You know, this is really the depth of these practices. So then let's go back. Let's talk again about the Amara um, Center in Ojai and your sure. your vision of it and the and the purpose, because you've been working on this center for the the, the birthing of it for, uh, a, for couple about of years. a year and a half. Now. Yeah. yeah, correct. Yeah. So it's been a really wonderful process to collaborate and work with many friends and practitioners in this effort, you know, what we're really striving to do, and I believe we are, we are actually doing at this point, is to be a community point, a point where people can gather and gather to really look at and to activate their own healthy state. When we're looking at how to get ourselves completely healthy, we're, yes, we are talking about these classes and how we can really work with activating our physical body. But a part of it, too, is do we feel like we're, we belong to a community? Mm. Or, or do we feel like we're separate and we're kind of on our own? I mean, especially <laughs> having grown up in California, we're all driving in cars. We're all driving in separate boxes. Right. And so there's this feeling of separation. And... Another part of this whole inspiration of Amara is to create a community healing center where everyone can gather together and really feel like they are a part of a greater whole. And in this feeling is where we can really kind of uh, get a synchronized energetic flow where everyone begins to help each other 
you know, whether it's on a very subtle level or, you know, in a class of being able to just give your friend a hand. So what I really see is the inspiration of Amara as we've been working with it and as we're having the grand opening on March 26th on Saturday is really to give a gift and an offering to the community to be able to come together and to be able to recognize in each other that there is an ability to have a deeper healing for oneself and for each other, and also to have a place to go where when it feels like life is really tough. <laughs> yeah. Because I, I know that we all go through that. And to be able to come to a community where other people are also going through the same life cycle. Life is going to be tough for all of us. But when we can come together and we can at least feel like, okay, well, at least I'm not alone, it makes it much easier. And this is really the inspiration for a much greater holistic healing that we can have, that we can have also in our physical body as well as in our mental body. And to be able to bring ourselves to a greater spiritual awareness. I see. I, and Alan, I so, um, first of all, I've been to Amara, everybody. It's a beautiful space. And you walk in and you just, everything just goes, ah, before <laughs> Alan even comes out to say hi to you. But um, this morning I was having a tea with a friend and there, and there was another woman sitting next to us who I know. And um, she started to hedge on you know I asked her how she was doing and I could tell something was going on and and as she began to talk she started to share that she's just finished raising four kids she's exhausted and she started crying and and I know for many people when they hit that point of exhaustion or overwhelm if there's a health issue or emotional or mental issue we often cocoon we go within and we don't reach out we don't connect we don't uh right try and and be a part of community because from a lot of people now I'm just talking about myself but for me sometimes that pain or the exhaustion is so much that I don't want to be a burden to somebody I don't want to share it with somebody I don't want people poking at me trying to fix me so this the whole vision for Amara in Ojai is so kind and gentle and with plenty of space for people to come in and do some of the classes or get acupuncture with you, Alan, and feel that they are connected and cared for. Yes, that really is the view and inspiration that we have for Amara. I think that we, the more that we have a space to do this, the more that we can recognize that, that like you, like your friend this morning, we're all going through difficult times at different parts of our lives. And when we actually gather together, even though at first there may be some resistance, really we can actually come to a place where it's a place of relaxation and actually just being near people. Um, ironically, uh, you know, we don't really have mass transit, but just being near people is actually a chance to let ourselves heal and to heal other people. We don't even have to do anything. Right. Just to be in the same space with people. Right. Yes. And and so this reminds me now, one of the other modalities you practice uh, is Reiki. Correct. Now, could you speak to that? Because I, you know, I had a Reiki session once in my life. I got nothing out of it. (laughs) Right. Truly, I got nothing out of it. A friend said, oh, I know Reiki. Let me do this for you. I'm like, I'm not feeling it. I'm not feeling it. Right. But so, with the work so that you do, it's integral. It's, so Reiki is, it really comes from uh, a much longer uh, lineage. So it actually has, has foundations in many different uh, healing modalities and also in ancient a Vedic Indian, as well as uh, Tibetan medicine, as well as Chinese medicine. Hmm. Um, I did not know about, that. 
Yes. When we're talking about Reiki, we're also talking about uh, how to uh, use our own body as kind of a tuning fork, or maybe you could say like a radio transmitter, or maybe a better way to say it is we can, now that we all have cell phones, that we can all become a personal hotspot. <laughs> <laughs> example, I mean, it's very interesting because we can, we can put also a correlation between energetic healing and prayer in some ways. Oh, let's talk about that. Yes, because in prayer, when we're putting an intention into, into, some, into something or someone, we, oftentimes we see a very positive shift or change. And really the same way with Reiki or energetic healing, it really works. Going back to hospitals in China, in China there are actually hospitals of qigong, and qigong there's many qigong just is really talking is means the practice of energetic and energy, and so there are medical energetic centers that are qigong hospitals in China, wow. where people are trained to tune themselves to be a very strong transmitter very strong personal hotspot to be able to generate a frequency vibration that allows healing to occur. There's, there was a very uh, famous video that I've seen from a Chinese doctor practicing Qigong, and they were working with uh, a man with uh, a quite a large tumor. The tumor, they, they had an ultrasound that was real-time. So an ultrasound is a device that allows them to look into the body through the, through the tissue and be able to see that there was a large tumor in the body. And with the ultrasound on the television screen, you could see the tumor was there. And over a period of about five minutes, as the Chigo practitioner was working with it, they actually saw the tumor shrink from the size of about like almost a football to almost nothing. Wow. So, so that is a pretty radical and very dynamic uh, practice of, of energetic medicine. But I just wanted to give that as a very strong example of what is, what is actually possible. Um, and you know, when we're talking about Reiki, it really depends on the practitioner. Mm-hmm. It really depends on how practiced somebody is. You know, the I, I would say it's almost like you know, for for anyone practicing sports, if you're talking about like, okay, you know, if you're playing basketball and you're shooting free throws, you know, somebody who is in high school throwing free throws as opposed to like how Michael Jordan was throwing free throws, you know, it's completely different because there's a long practice and there's, a, and there's an ability that's developed through that. So, you know, there's, a, there's different levels of what, what we can work with. But Reiki is, is a really gentle way, and many times as I'm working with acupuncture, I will work with just putting my hands on patients and just allowing a gentle flow. I mean, when we think about Reiki, it's almost like if you think about how a parent or a friend can just put their hand on your shoulder and you just feel like this, ah, and yeah. just feel better. It's and comforted. It comforted. And that, at its very, you know, uh, you know, that's a very simple way to kind of explain how it's working. And so, it, you know, if we're looking for something very, very, uh, you know, dynamic and to happen, sometimes we, we might miss what is really happening with Reiki. But it is a very wonderful, uh, gentle way to heal that is that I've also been practicing for about 15 years. Yeah. And uh, when we talk about Reiki also, um, and also with healing as a, as a whole, uh, 
I think it's also important to talk about how to set up a container or how to set up a, a space that is healing. And as you mentioned, you know, just earlier, how walking into the center at, of Amara, that there's a feeling of just at ease or at peace. And this is really also a deep part of the healing process, is creating an environment that we feel at ease in. And we can do this at our home as well as, and you know, I think it's very important in the healing center. That's what we strove to create in establishing Amara. And I, I, I'm very grateful to all of my friends who helped to create the physical building of Amara and to really set the energy because every person that's walked through the doors at Amara has said the same thing, that they feel something uh, very, that's very uh, vital but calming. Vital uh, and calming, yes. Uh-huh. Exactly. That's how I feel yeah. when I walk in there. Oh, good. And besides, good. it's just it's just beautiful. The, it's got a vista. And it's just beautiful. So the yeah. um, you're actually having a grand opening on Saturday, March 26th. And it's, this is a whole day event if people choose to participate all day or a partial day. So let's talk a little yeah. bit about that. Great, yeah. So the grand opening on Saturday, it's the 26th of March, and that will be um, from 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. And the best way to be able to see the information and to sign up for the different classes that are offered a half price that day is to go on to Eventbrite. And when you go on to Eventbrite, if you look up Amara of Ojai Grand Opening, and Amara is spelled A-M-A-R-A. Ojai is O-J-A-I. And so it's Amara of Ojai Grand Opening on Eventbrite. You'll be able to find the page that will give you the whole schedule of events. We'll be starting at 9 a.m. and I'll be leading a meditation. And at 10 a.m., then... Jenny Azuma will be leading a class on Lock Your Body, which is really working with somatic um, postures from a physical therapy standpoint. What somatic is, postures mean, Alan? Really what it means is how, how we're looking at how we're holding our bodies. We're really living in a world where we're sitting at desks and sitting in cars mm-hmm. a lot. Mm-hmm. So we're, we're actually shortening different muscles in our body and creating um, various tensions in our body that don't allow us or inhibit the way that our body naturally wants to be. So in the class, what Jetty does is to give us hints on how to be able to be an urban desk warrior and still be able to have your flexibility. (laughs) I love that. Yay. I'm I'm going to take that class. He's he's very, very good. Yeah. So so, um, Jetty is a doctor of physical therapy, and he'll be teaching that class from... 10 o'clock to 11.30. And on Saturday at 11.30, then Dastan Kalili will be doing our Qigong class. And Dastan has been practicing with Master Zhou, who is a quite a well-renowned uh, martial artist, uh, healer, and Qigong master in Los Angeles. I've and heard Dastan, of him. I have actually heard of him. Yes, he, he's quite well-known for... Uh, working, you know, doing uh, different modalities of healing as well as uh, being able to create quite a large amount of heat in his hands. Uh, he actually lights paper on fire with his hands. I've heard that, yes. Yeah. Wow. And, and so Dostan has been studying with him for seven, I think almost eight years now, and has been um, given the opportunity to be able to teach the beginning levels of Qigong. So Dastan will be teaching from 11.30 on Saturday. And then we'll have a a break uh, from 12.30 to 3 o'clock. And then at 3 o'clock, then Lily Kutsuba will be teaching the Taoist yoga class. And her yoga is a really wonderful, gentle stretching and gentle holding of various yoga postures that is really, really wonderful. I mean, this is a yoga that is available for any any age, any ability of yoga, and at any level, you will still be able to get a lot out of it. 
uh, with all the different postures, there's a, there's a very gentle way to initiate the posture, and then if it's easy for some of the people in the class, they can move further into deeper postures. Mm-hmm. But what I found with Lily is that she is uh, well versed to be able to work with a whole different variety of skills <clears throat> and and ages to be able to allow everyone to get the most out of her yoga class. And then and after so, that, there's a Tai Chi with you. Correct. At, at, uh, at 4.30, then I'll be having a Tai Chi class. Um, and the Tai Chi is the Tai Chi Chuan, the Yang style, that was taught to me by my grandfather. And I began studying it. Well, I guess it's been more like about 25 years. Um, and he, after he passed in 2002, I continued to practice, and I, I was also teaching at Austin College for four years. Mm. Um, and so it's it's a really wonderful practice to for all beginners and those who have had some experience. And Tai Chi, again, is just a really wonderful way to have a gentle physical body movement, but also to really do a healing. And so after the Tai Chi, then at 5.30 that I will be doing an uh, opening ceremony of Kudo Zen Archery. And the Kudo is really a moving meditation that was taught by my teacher, Kanjiro Shibata Sensei and Sam West. Um, Shibata Sensei has passed away uh, almost two years now. And what his, what his uh, way of practice is that this, archery is done in a way that it's a moving meditation to be able to open our hearts ultimately. Mm, that makes sense. Yeah. So, so I'll be doing a demonstration shot as an opening for the second part of the day, which will be from 6 o'clock, and we'll be start to have some music, and we'll have some food and, um, and other drinks, uh, some different chai and some other uh, so some water that will have different flavors of of uh, herbs and different um, uh, leavens to be able to help to heal the body and to be able to, uh, to also give some nourishment and refreshment. And so we'll be having music and food and drink from 6 o'clock to 9 o'clock. Oh my and gosh, so, that sounds like fun. Well, I hope that your listeners will be able to have a chance to look on to the Eventbrite Amara of Ojai grand opening and be able to come by and see us. And Alan, if anybody who's listening wants to just come and get an appointment with you, how do they do that? They can they can give us a call and the number for the Chang Holistic Clinic at Amara of Ojai is 805-486-3400. And so they can call and we can give them information at a schedule for a time. 805-486-3494. So Correct. Uh, we're, we're almost out of time. Any one last thing you want to drop in here? Well, I would really like to say thank you so much, Susan, for your time and your graciousness and generosity to have me on the show. It's wonderful to really talk about the legacy that my father and my grandfather has given me. And I really hope that the inspiration that they've given me, I will be able to also give to the community and to individuals as they come into Amara of Ojai. Okay, so I got to tell you, my friend, you you are already doing that because you inspire me. So I thank (laughs) Thank you, you. Alan Chang, uh, for for joining me today. And we're just going to end with, and so it is, namaste.